Well, O'Reilly Media is a technical information company. We really see our fundamental business as spreading the knowledge of innovators. Gervais Restaurant, authentic French cuisine in Silicon Valley. Uh, we do it with books. We're actually uh, one of the world's largest computer book publishers. We also have conferences, uh, probably most famously, uh, we have the Web 2.0 conference, um, the o uh, Open Source Convention, and the Emerging Technology Conference are three of our flagship conferences. Uh, we do a lot. We, we realized fairly early on that the best way to market our books was actually, never mind talking about books, talk about the technology, talk about the product. So we've kind of developed an activism style of marketing, which has ended up putting us at the forefront of a lot of new technology uh, movements. So, for example, we discovered the World Wide Web when there were only 200 websites featured in a book and proceeded to go out and evangelize the web. We actually created the world's first commercial website, in fact, and the first site with advertising on the Internet. Uh, then later on, we organized this meeting called the Open Source Summit where we brought all the leaders of the projects together and said, these guys all do the same thing, and you know, <laughs> and kind of put, put open source on the radar. And then most recently, we, we coined the, the term Web 2.0 to describe what was distinguishing the, the companies that had survived the dot-com bust and effectively the new rules for the internet economy and the way internet applications are working today, treating the internet as a platform. When did you decide to actually branch out of books, or just doing books and conferences well, and uh, research? The, the first um, you know, breakthrough for us, uh, we, we had done actually a, a number of things. The uh, first departure from books was in uh, 1993. Uh, when we launched the first commercial website. It was a site called The Global Network Navigator, uh, which we ended up selling a few years later to AOL. Um, I mean, it was the first web portal, and it really it was an outgrowth of a book that we published called The Whole Internet User's Guide and Catalog. And we uh, launched it uh, really as a product to help promote the book. And then we looked at it and we said, that's not a demo, that's a product. And uh, so it was really, it was before Yahoo, it was the first point and click catalog to internet resources. And, uh, you know, in, in the course of developing it, I also came up with the business model, namely advertising. I said, gee, you know, I get my copy of magazines like InfoWorld and they're all supported by advertising. Why couldn't we have a free service that's ad supported? And I went and actually got permission from the National Science Foundation, which at that point had permission, uh, you know, had uh, oversight over the internet and said, could we do this? And they said, yes. Because up to that point, there was this very strong no commercial use. You know, there was what they called the AUP, the acceptable use policy. And I got this exception. Steve Wolf, who was the head of the NSF at the time, uh, oversight of the internet, the, the, the group, said, well, if you guys aren't in support of research and education, I don't know who is, so go for it. And uh, so that was really a, a, a turning point in internet history that I don't think has gotten quite as much attention as, uh, as it probably should. Um, and then later, we, we actually got into the software business. We actually launched the world's first uh, um, uh, PC-based web server before Microsoft was in the market. It was just we looked at the web and we said this was designed to be a groupware medium and it's becoming read-only you know, because the only web servers were uh, you know, on Unix and most of the clients were over on the PC. Uh, so we were in that business for a few years. Obviously that got, uh, became ground zero and everybody got into Windows-based web servers. You know, Microsoft went from we love you to sorry we have to kill you. Uh, uh, next uh, departure from books was uh, in 1997 around uh, uh, Perl. I had published uh, the second edition of a book called Programming Pearl, and uh, the buyer boarders told me uh, that it was one of the top 100 books in any category uh, if for them in all of 1997, or of all 1996, and I, I thought, wow, nobody's talking about Pearl. I looked at my computer trade press, and there was no mention of it, and I said, gee, this is actually the best-selling computer book nobody no is noticing. So I actually launched a Pearl conference, and then all of a sudden I realized, wait, all of my bestsellers are uh, these programs that nobody's talking about because there's no company behind them. So I organized the meeting, which I originally called the Freeware Summit, and it was at that meeting that everybody got together and said, hey, the name Free Software is, is not a good name, and we voted and came up with the, the new name, Open Source, and then we had a press conference that evening, you know, of all these guys, and they said, look, all these guys have dominant market share in these new category programs, nobody knows about them because they're not companies, they're individuals, and they're competing just with the power of their software, and uh, we have a new name for it, it's Open Source, and <laughs> I guess that was that was really the, the beginning of that uh, uh, 
revolution. But that also led me to this um, current business that we're really involved in. Roger Magulis here uh, is uh, uh, the director of, which is um, kind of next generation market research. We um, got into open source because we had access to data that other people didn't. We, you know, we were a, a publisher at, and we knew about the sales of books on things like Perl and Apache and Linux. Uh, you know, were pretty significant and that told us that there was an interest there that was sort of below the radar of people who, as I think Gideon Gartner once told me, uh, his model, he said, we talk to the large vendors, we talk to the large end users, and we talk to the Wall Street banks, and we sell to each of them what they le we learn from the others. And nobody was paying attention to what the bottom-up technologists were doing. And that's really always been the audience that O'Reilly has served, you know, the self-taught, uh, homegrown guys who are really inventing the future. Just they have some idea, and they, you know, I, I, I sometimes call them alpha geeks. And uh, But what we started to do was we said, well, there's a lot of actual sources of technology trends data in telling these stories. So we started building a data warehouse where we could accumulate information that would help us predict technology trends. And then we, uh, you know, sort of started sort of focusing much more on this idea of watching the future as it emerges and helping to guide people uh, to think about it. Gervais Restaurant, authentic French cuisine in Silicon Valley. Google Hacks it was, an, you know, nobody had published any books about Google up to that point. <laughs> so, you know, so in some sense that even though Google is now very much on the radar, you know, we started that process before Google was front and center on everybody's mind, front and center. And how do you how do you keep up? Well, the ma coming? mainly you build a network of people who you think are interesting, and then you just watch what they're doing. Um, but it, 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 the book market is actually fairly challenging these days, just because the the, the main the big chains are cutting. Back their coverage of computer books. The sections have never quite recovered uh, since uh, you know the, the dot com bust. Even though the market has recovered, the computer book section hasn't. Partly because people are getting more of their technical information online on the web. That, by the way, is one of our businesses. We have an online book service called Safari. Uh, and the reason we did that was because we we looked at the ebook market. And we said, Gee, this is the wrong approach. Uh, the advantage of being online is you can search. You don't just want to search one book; you want to search all the books. So we got together with uh, Pearson, who's a conglomerate that owns many of the other leading computer book publishers, and started this joint venture uh, to create an online library that people could subscribe to and search across. You know, at this point, about 4,000 you know computer books. All the O'Reilly books. All the O'Reilly books. All the Addison Wesley books. All the Peach Pit books. All the Sam's books. All the uh, Prentice Hall books. Uh, Cisco Press. Uh, you know. Sun Press, you know, all this. So it's, it's a pretty extensive collection. So Gervais Restaurant, authentic French cuisine in Silicon Valley. Well, you have to look at, at uh, and there's no single um, trend. There are many overlapping trends that are all a product of the same, if you like, deep trends. So people are getting their information online. So if you look at how that's reflected in, say, the computer book market, it's, it's first off, um, uh, there are many niche topics that are actually too small uh, for books because they're moving too fast. Uh, uh, or they're they're just you know very narrow and, and the market can't take that many books right now. So you know increasingly you have to publish online only. So we have a program for something we call shortcuts, where we're just literally here's a little take on okay this is a new Ruby on Rails uh, uh, you know subsystem you know for example um, the. Uh, um, uh, also, the, f the format of books that work has changed. You know, five, ten years ago, we were selling a lot of reference books. You think about a book like Java in a nutshell. pages. Yeah, uh, you know, quick reference, Java in a nutshell. Uh, now people can go online for API references. So the types of books that we're selling um, most successfully now are things that are difficult to do on the web. So our, among our best sellers are the Head First series, uh, which are these uh, you know teaching guides that uh, try to get people engaged in, with games and activities, and uh, they really you know how do you 
get your head around difficult concepts. And they're really hard to do online, and, but they work wonderfully as books. So, you know, uh, every one of those is, is in our top ten that we publish. Uh, and, uh, but also, another type of book that we've been very successful with are books that actually, in some ways, have learned from the web. If you look at a book like The Pearl Cookbook or um, uh, Google Hacks, uh, in a lot of ways, these books are uh, reflections of the way people have learned to read on the web. They're collections of web pages in some ways. You know, the, you know, the, the Pearl Cookbook is, you know, you can read any one of, of uh, you know, 300 uh, two-page entries. You know, you can jump around uh, to get just what you want, as opposed to sort of continuous narrative books. Um, that's also part of what led us to uh, another of our new ventures, which is a magazine called Make. Uh, Make is a, a magazine about sort of uh, do-it-yourself uh, technology. Uh, kind of been described uh, variously as Martha Stewart for geeks and uh, you know popular mechanics for the 21st century. Uh, but if you look at the, the publishing model there, it's interesting. First of all, it's an integrated publishing model where we have a print piece, namely a, it's a quarterly magazine, uh, but we also have a very popular uh, blog. Uh, <laughs> magazine.com. Uh, we also have an event called the Maker Fair. Uh, we had 20,000 people show up to this uh, sort of show and tell, people showing all the cool things they were doing. So um, we're also working on television. Um, so, uh, but again, if you look at Make, it's it's a lot of, of the stories are culled from the net. You know, the blog, in some sense, is almost like a drift net where we get we gather data, and then the, the more interesting ones we drill down a little deeper with the uh, with features in the magazine, and then the things that are really really interesting we take to books. So, and it's also kind of uh, how we also sh you know how we asked earlier how we get to new topics. I think that the um, the way that we got to make is, is is illustrative. We just you know you watch the news. You know we we you have some idea about a trend. So we thought, hmm, uh, manufacturing uh, is kind of going the way of laser printing. You know, as you, you know, the things that you see, you know, you realize that, that, you know, between laser printers and cheap CNC machines, you know, personal manufacturing is a trend. Yeah. Secondly, you've got uh, the fact that there's a lot of disposable technology. There's things where you can get cheap components. You can even get, you know, custom manufacturing. You know, you can get d things done in small lots, uh, you know, in Asia or wherever. Um, and then we just started watching all these do-it-yourself stories. People taking apart their, you know, okay, you're on your your. Uh, you know your fifth digital camera. What do you do with the old ones? They still have some value, you know. And we we started noticing a lot of stories in the in the sort of popular tech media, like on Slashdot, about people hacking their hardware. You know, there was one great story about a guy who made a cat feeder out of an old VCR. You know, sort of like you go away, uh, you know, for a few days. You know, you can program the timer, and it actually has a little mechanism where it can, you know, push out, uh, you know, the so the, the food and uh, you know, it's sort of like, whoa, what an odd idea. And yet, it, you start seeing enough of those, and you start seeing a trend. And the trend is towards personalized manufacturing. So then we decided, oh, let's do a, you know some books, and then we launched the magazine. And sure enough, once again, we're we're right on the spot. And the biggest thing uh, there's a couple of things that we're focused on uh, right now, which is really the disruptive nature of Web 2.0. Uh, a lot of people are, are uh, you know, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of opportunity, but also a lot of change. You know, take, take YouTube as a good example. You know, while the, the, um, the media was all concerned about piracy and, oh my gosh, what's going to happen? Uh, YouTube has actually pioneered a new style of movie watching. People are all of a sudden watching these short five-minute clips. You know, if you uh, actually, uh, you know, you think about uh, the Academy Awards and the idea of that uh, when they go up their best short film. Well, uh, you know, a few years ago, probably the number of people who have seen the Academy Award-winning best short film is was a pretty small number. 
And now all of a sudden you have millions of people who are watching short films on the web. Right? So here's actually a behavior change that is actually going to lead leads to an enormous opportunity for a company like YouTube. Uh, but secondly, it, it really leads to a long-term structural change in how people consume media. And that's, it kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier about books and the web. You know, people now are used to consuming content you know, in terms of, of pages. Same thing happened in music, you know. The, the industry had albums, uh, you know, peer-to-peer uh, -peer came along and then iTunes, and now all of a sudden the song and the playlist are the unit of, of information sharing and, and, and information packaging. And I think we're in a similar um, transition with video. And so those are examples of the way that, um, you know, the first changes with Web 2.0 are sort of structural changes. And then secondly, they become behavioral changes. And thirdly, they become economic changes. And where are we now? Well, we're still in the, in the you know, we're exploring the new economics. Uh, and some people are having great breakthroughs. Obviously, Google uh, you know, became this huge economic engine on the back of a, of a Web 2.0. But I think we're really still in the very early stages of we'll look back and and we'll see a profound transformation. The other thing that I'm really focused on, you know, I've sort of been clarifying my, if you like, my definition of Web 2.0, and I've got it down to systems that get smarter the more people use them. And more meaning, it's, it's really, the, the, they're, they're effectively applications that are driven by network effects. You know, and, and, and network effects in particular in the data. You know, um, the web gets better every time somebody puts up a new page or makes a link, and Google figured out how to leverage that in a way that their competitors in their early search engines didn't. Uh, you know, Amazon gets better the more you know users comment, rate, uh, you know, uh, even purchase. You know, so Amazon has figured out how to instrument that and use it real time. Uh, if you look at a photo sharing site like Flickr, their breakthrough in a lot of ways was a simple change in the way that uh, you set the defaults. Uh, Flickr basically said default is to share. You know, uh, you, if you compare, going try uploading a photo to Shutterfly, and it says enter a list of email addresses with whom you would like to share this photo. You upload to Flickr, and there's a radio button that says public, private. Default is public, and that's what led to its explosive growth. Uh, so ended up with network effects. You also then they, they, they added features like tagging where there was actually, a, and here it is, a user interface element that grows dynamically you know, on the basis of what people do and how they name their photos. You know, so for example, when we did the Maker Fair, all of a sudden they're at the top. Here are the most popular photos. Well, Maker Fair was up there in the past 24 hours, the most commonly tagged. So here's a user interface that lets people find something new. You look at a site like Dig, you know, uh, media, where the users are voting on the most interesting stories, and that's how they get to the homepage. Um, so there's a, there's a new set of, of, of dynamics that I think are leading to, again, I think we're at the point where people are, are understanding them now, and they're starting to apply them to uh, you know, build new businesses. Right. Uh, Thank you very much, yeah. Tim. All right, Thanks. you're welcome. Gervais Restaurant, authentic French cuisine in Silicon Valley.